Hey everyone, my name is Raymond and you're watching Board Game Heaven. In this episode, I'm taking a look at the Lindisfarne by Alain Prade and Damien Fleury. It's published by Runes Edition and it's a game about Vikings who are out to plunder in Europe. And it's a game of dice rolling of card set collection. And uh, it's a quick, fun little game, plays in about 45 minutes for two to four players. So let me open up the box and show you what's inside. I'll set up a game, then explain the rules, and finally, I'll give you my final thoughts. So, Lindisfarne by Runes Editions is a very compact box. And on the back, you will see a bit of the gameplay laid out there. It's a game for two to four players, ages 10 and up, 45 minutes, and a bit of text in English and French. So let's just open it up. I've already opened it. So we have uh, the rule book in English and French there. We have these two sheets and they are double sided. And one side will have the explanation of some of the Norway cards. They, they are special cards with special abilities. And this is a scoring card which tells you how many points you can score if you meet certain conditions. This is for collecting panoramas and this is for collecting certain cards or a number of colors and a number of cards of a certain set. So this is all explained here. This is uh, uh, language independent so you can put the English side up for the rules and the non-language side of the scoring up. And if you're French, of course, you just flip them around. Then we got some uh, tiles here. And the cool thing is these are double sided. One side has the player board. So this is the board you'll be playing on. And you kind of put it together like so. So there is um, here is Europe. And that's how you put it together. So you've got three. Uh, zones where you can put your discs on, which I will explain in a bit. And after you've played everything, you can flip this over and you've got a scoring track here with, again, this explained how the scoring works. But it's pretty cool that you can use those double-sided. And furthermore, you will find some runes here, which I already put in a Ziploc bag. You will find the player tokens in four different colors. You will find the cards. This is the first player token. That's a nice 3D token as well. Six uh, blue dice, which have printed sides. They're not, uh, they don't have dents for pips. And there is a whole stack of cards, of course, in here. So you have those different sorts. You have these, and you've got some, uh, promotional cards there and you have these cards with the shield on it and the box itself is the inside of a ship a longboat that you can use as a dice tray all right let's set up a game and explain the rules to set up a game of Lindisfarne you take three tiles and you set them up to form Europe like this you can keep the two reference sheets nearby as well Put the box that serves as a dice tray and the dice nearby. Each player takes the six tokens of their clan's color. Keep the rune tokens nearby, as well as the first player marker. Then out of these cards, find the ten Norway cards, which are the cards with the yellow banner. And they all have an icon at the bottom, which are these ten over here that are explained on that card. So you take those, give them a shuffle, and you randomly take out two, and you leave them out of the game, which leaves you with eight, and those eight are shuffled into this deck of cards. And after you've shuffled that destination deck, you deal out two cards next to each part of the map, like so. You keep the rest nearby. Then you take these objective cards, and they come in different colors, indicating which countries you are going to pillage and loot. So there's six different colors here, basically Spain, France, Southern England, Northern England, Ireland, and Norway. And these are explained here as well, as well as all the cards that you can find. So you take all those cards, give that deck a shuffle, and just put them near the board. 
Finally, you determine who is the starting player and give that player the starting player token. And now you're ready to play Lindisfarne. So a game of Lindisfarne is played in six expeditions and each expedition is composed of multiple rounds. Starting with the owner of the Jarl Pawn and continuing clockwise, each player will choose one of two actions. First, you can prepare to depart or you can return to the village. If a player wants to depart, they take all the dice, as many as they have uh, tokens left, so at the start of the game that will be six, and they roll those dice. Then the player needs to allocate one at least of those dice to one of these three boards. You can add as many dice as you want to the same board for that turn, but not to any other boards. And in order to do so, a player will place Viking tokens equal to the number of dice they want to spend on that board. So for example, if this player wanted to allocate these two sixes onto that board, and he's the first player, then he takes two of his Viking tokens and puts them in the square number six here. There's uh, indicated one through six. And the first player always takes the top row of that board. Now, for example, if the second player rolled a six and a five, they could say, okay, then I'm going to go to the same board and I'll play a six and a five over here. And he has to take the second row because the first row is already taken by the blue player. And let's say another player rolled this result, a one, two, three, and four. And they wanted to go to this board because, as you can see, there are different icons on these boards. And that means that you score differently. So in this board, you score by adding up all the points of your tokens. So this is 2 times 6. This is 6 plus 5. Here, the longest row of consecutive tokens wins. And here, the biggest stack of tokens. So if I had a 1, 2, 3, 4, then that player could say, well, I'm just going to spend four Viking tokens on one, two, three, four of that board, and he'll already have a row of four, which is pretty good. Then if the fourth player, for example, rolled three sixes or three or maybe two, but whatever, he wants to make a stack, then in this case, they could take those three sixes that they rolled and put them on the first spot here on the number six. Then next round, then you take the dice again, and every player rolls for their own turn, of course. So now the first player will have four tokens left, meaning they only get to roll four dice. Roll them. So they got two fours, a five, and a two. Now maybe that player also wants to go here and make a long row, but they need a three to have four consecutive uh, Viking tokens on that board. Now, if you have any rune tokens uh, at your disposal, then you can spend a rune token to uh, make to increase one of the dice or decrease one of the dice by one point. Note that you cannot make a six into a one or a one into a six, but in this case, uh, the player could take a four and turn it into a three, giving him a row of two, three, four, five, and he could take all of his remaining tokens and put them here, two, three, four, five. So the rows are now equally long, both are four tokens long, but the value of these is higher. So in case of a tie in length here, the value counts, and if that's a tie as well, then the player highs up the board wins. On this board, it's practically the same. It's just the total amount of points, and if that total were equal, then the player higher up the board would win. And in this case, it's the highest stack. But if there was an equally high stack of three tokens and of also the same value, then again, the person highest up the rank wins. So let's say a couple of players played some more tokens. And maybe like this, well, this is pointless, but maybe they still wanted to go there. They could still get something out of this. So then uh, the blue player will have already spent all his tokens. The yellow player still has one left, so they could roll one die on their turn. Or if they think, well, that's not going to help me anyway, well, they could try to roll a six and maybe get the majority here. Or even with a five, they'll have three tokens versus these two sixes. Uh, but maybe they just, they just want to stop. 
because if you stop, you will return to Norway, to your village. And the first person to arrive there, to basically stop uh, pillaging and looting, will take the Jarl token and become the first player in the next round. Furthermore, for each Viking token they have left, they gain a rune token, so that's how you get those. There are also some of these Norway cards, like this one, uh, that have certain effects, and some of them will give you runes as well. So then uh, all players have had their last turn, the black player still needs to go, maybe he wants to take a gamble and just roll another die, well that's a one, that's useless. But so putting it there would be useless uh, there as well, because he still already has the highest stack over there. And there is still a place here, well he could place it there, you know, if everything fails. Just put it there on the one. So then everybody has taken their turn, and then the round ends. So when the expedition ends, you start tallying up your points. So you check each of these boards and decide who's the winner. So like I said, on this board, the highest total number wins. So what happens then? The blue player here has the highest score. It's got 12 points. That player can now decide either to take one of these cards, and these destination cards are worth point in the end. So this Norway card, for example, is worth two points. This green uh, card is worth one point. Uh, the Norway cards also additionally have these bonuses, which are explained over here. And the other cards have a part of a panorama. So you can see there is dots on this, five dots, and the shield is on the second dot, meaning that in this panorama it's the second card over there. And you can try to complete longer parts of the panorama to score points as well. But a player who's in the lead may also choose to uh, refuse one of these uh, destination cards and instead take the first two of these objective cards. Then they pick one of them and then they put the other one at the bottom of the pile. So they look at them and they think, well, maybe the next one that I'm in, uh, in, in the, the lead is this one over here. So I might want, uh, let's see, it's uh, green and gray. This one has a green destination on it. So I'll take that one. So I'll put this one on the bottom. And he picks that card instead of picking one of those. So he's done. He takes his tokens off. And he takes that card as well, keeping it hidden. Of course, you don't need to others to see which, which objectives you have. Then the second player is in the lead with 11 points and that player decides to pick this card because it's worth two points and gives him an additional bonus. He takes his tokens off of the map and also takes that card. There we go. Then the third person he has 10 points. Uh, if there is still a card left, they can either take that card or still refuse and get an objective card instead, but that person also decides to take this card and takes his tokens back. But then the last player, there is no more cards left and he can't say I'll take an objective card instead because in order to do so you have to be able to refuse a destination card. But they're gone so he gets nothing. The same happens here, so the person with the longest rows, the red and the blue players, uh, but the blue one has a higher score if you add up the numbers so that player gets to pick a card so that player took an, uh, uh, an objective card and so he wants the green card so he's going to take that one it's also worth two points in the end so that's good he can take his tokens off of the map and then uh, the second in row is the red player who will also decide to take a card leaving the third player again left with nothing. So all the tokens can be removed. And then the final map, the black player is in the lead with three tokens on number six, the highest stack. This is also three tokens, but he's second in line, so he won't uh, get the first choice. The black player chooses this card. And then the second player might want to refuse that and take an objective card instead. So the yellow player takes this card. There we go. Uh, yeah, you pick two and then you select one. Forgot to do that this time. 
and then there is no more players left, but there's still a card, and that simply means that that guard gets discarded, removed from the game. So then it's time for the second expedition out of six, and all players, starting with the player who had the Jarl token, which is in this case the yellow player, uh, get to uh, roll the dice again. So you start over, you have six uh, tokens at the start of the round, you roll them, look at that, that's uh, two sixes and a five, so that player decides to go for the win here again, so two sixes and a five on that map, hoping to score the highest points. Oh, and I forgot that at each round, of course, you also flip over two more new destination cards at each map. So play continues, and you play that for six rounds, and after the sixth expedition, you tally up your points. So you flip over the three playing boards and form this score track. And this is how scoring happens. And this is also printed on this reference card. So you can refer to that during the game when this is flipped over. And what this means is that for each completed objective card, you get 10 points. So these are your objective cards and they all have three countries printed on them. So if these are one of the player's cards, then he can see if he fulfilled any of those. So red, green, and gray. He's got red cards, he's got green cards, he's got one gray card. But because he only has one gray card, he can only fulfill one of his two objective cards because they both have a gray symbol on them. But this one also has a black symbol on him. He doesn't have any black cards, so he's not going to be able to fulfill this objective anyway. So I'll just flip that over. But this one is fulfilled. But had he had any other cards that he could have fulfilled with another gray one, then he wouldn't have been possible to do that because you can only use all of your cards per objective card once. So that's 10 points. You simply take one of your tokens, put it on the 10 there. Next, you score four points per majority of any of these six country cards. So let's say this player had the majority of red cards. So he gets four points. You add a second token over here. In case of a tie, uh, all players get that amount of points. Then he did not have any other majorities, so that's that. And thirdly, you simply add up the points that are printed on your card. So that's one plus two is three, five, six, zero is still six, 8, 10, 11 points, so that's 1 and 10. And finally, you check to see if you made any frescoes as printed here, and that will score you points according to the number of uh, adjacent pictures. So in this case, in the green uh, cards, he's got the uh, 4 and the 5 linked up, so that's two cards in a row, that's two points, 1, 2. But here, in the red country, He's got four linking cards, the first, second, third, and fourth in this case. So that means four cards in a row, that's 10 points. So in the end, this player has gathered 37 points. And all the other players do the same, of course, and they track their numbers here, and that could be on the same spot. So uh, like this, perhaps. And then, of course, the player with the highest amount of points is the mightiest viking and wins the game. And so that is how you play Lindisfarne. Let's go to my final thoughts. So my final thoughts on Lindisfarne by Runes Editions. Well, uh, presentation wise, I like how this game looks. It really gives you the viking vibe. The artwork on the cards is really cool. I love the fact that you can make these uh, big panoramas with all these cards. It's really lovely. I like the fact that these boards look like actual wooden carved boards with the map on it. Uh, it has a bit of a strange configuration and it has a border, so I kind of wished that it was a big square folded map, like a mini board that you can fold into four parts, you know, so you'd have the entire wooden board but, you know, it is what it is. And besides, it has a function because, you know, the other side has the scoring track, which is made out of three boards. So, fine, you know, it doesn't take up a lot of space. 
but that's the only thing that I thought, you know, presentation wise would have made it that much cooler. But it does look really nice. It looks like an actual wooden board. Uh, it's really nicely illustrated. The cards are nice. The cards are very clear as well. It has all the information on it that you need to know with these colored banners. That's the countries that you're gonna go for. You know, there's plenty of these objective cards. There's a lot of these location cards. Uh, the chips. You know, all the, the tokens are of a decent quality. They're just good, solid cardboard chips in clear colors. You've got a first player token that is just fine with the Jarl with, a, with an axe standing on a hill. <laughs> so that's very thematic. I like the fact that the inside of the box is actually, you know, shaped like a long boat that can be used as a dice tray. I mean, that's brilliant. I love that. So, you know, tiny box, so functional. The only thing that's a bit weird is the dice themselves. They're just very plain blue dice and they have, it's like these dots were like stamped on or something. I don't know exactly how that works, but it's like these dice had indentations that then got completely filled in white, um, you know, like with filler or something. I don't know how they make these, but I've never seen dice like these before. They were a bit weird and I like fancy dice, you know, so these are very plain, but okay, they do what they need to do. They roll and they have dots on them. So I guess that's okay too. The runes are nice, you know, they're all different. So you got these different uh, Viking runes that you can, you know, that you cast the runes and that's pretty thematic as well. And you can use them to influence your dice. So that's thematic as well. Uh, all you need to know is condensed on these two little sheets over there so that's also very handy and the gameplay itself i rather like i ra rather like the fact that you just you know, you roll dice check your results pick the results you want to use and put them on either one of these three boards using your tokens that's it and then you decide so who had the highest value on each of these three pieces of the continent and that player gets first choice of either a location card or decline that card and get one of these cards. That's fine. And while playing that, you figure out your strategy. You know, are you going to fulfill a panorama? Are you going to fulfill as many of these objective cards as you can? Because those are 10 points each for each of them fulfilled. And you need to have three unique cards for each of them. So you do have to gather those cards. So there's a bit of strategy there and I once was going for all of those so I had like three of those objective cars completed but somebody else just completely beat me by having like three panoramas or something and I was like oh wow you were going for panoramas I hadn't even noticed so that's pretty cool you don't know exactly what everybody has done until the end of the game unless you pay a lot of attention into what they are going for so there is quite a bit of strategy in here and I like that as well so in the end I'm going to give this two thumbs up. It's a simple game, but it has a lot of strategy and depth, and it's, it's got a cool presentation. I like it. It's, uh, it was a surprisingly cool game to play. So that's Linda's Farm, and uh, I hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching. Please give it a thumbs up, and don't forget to subscribe, and I'll see you next time on Board Game Heaven.